Hello everyone, my name is Met Hatil Masri. Today we're going to focus on creating an ASP.NET Core 2.0 web API app with SQLite. Let's get started. So the first thing is we will create a new directory to put our application in. So we'd go to the command prompt. I'll create a new directory called Web API SQL Lite. And I'll go to that directory. Now in this directory, I want to scaffold an application that is an MVC core application that uses SQLite. So the command for that is dot net new MVC minus minus of individual. And that should scaffold for us an application. Now, to run this application, all we have to do is type in .NET run and it will do it. This is the command that you need to enter to run the application. Now at this point, it's running the web server and there's a web server called Kestrel and it's listening on port 5000. So let's open up a browser and see what we've got. And we're going to point our browser to localhost 5000. Hit enter. And sure enough, we've got a website. Now, the next step is, it's much easier to work in Visual Studio 2017. So I'm going to open up this application in Visual Studio 2017. All I need to do is type in the proj, the name of the proj file. And because this extension is associated with Visual Studio, it will open it up in Visual Studio. And here's the application loaded up in Visual Studio. So in order to run it, I can hit Control F5 in Visual Studio and it should open it up in IIS Express. And here it is. Now, we'll notice it's using a different port number. In this case, it is port number 55237. Now, I'd like to create a web API controller here so that I can serve some student information. I will go back to Visual Studio and in my models folder, I'm going to create a new class called student. And here's my student class. So I'm going to paste the code that constitutes my student class right in here. So what I've got is a student ID, a first name, a last name, a school, and a start date. The next thing I want to do is create a context. Now, I already have a context here, which is in this file application DB context. What I'll do here is I'll define the fact that I have a student collection by entering db set student and student here. Now, at this stage, I can carry out my migrations. So there are two important commands when doing migrations. And they are .NET EF migrations add, and you give it a name for a migration. This creates the migrations file, which are essentially the fluid API commands that actually generate the tables and the artifacts in the database. And the next step is to do .NET EF database update. 
this actually physically creates those artifacts in the database. Before we do anything else, we need to rebuild our application. So I'm going to hit Control Shift B on my keyboard. And alternatively, you can come here and go build, build solution, does the same thing. Then let's execute those commands for doing migrations. So the first one we said is .NET EF migrations add, and we'll give it a name, first migration. So this is the command that I'm executing. The next command we want to execute is .NET EF database update. Now, we come across an error here. And the error suggests that SQLite does not support this migration operation, add foreign keys operation. The problem is that SQLite doesn't quite have good support for Entity Framework when it comes to dealing with foreign keys. The fix for that is to go back into our code, have a look at the, the migration files that were generated. Lastly, has to do with this file over here. Remember, we called our migration first migration. So let's have a look at this file. I'm going to open it up. You will notice that it's dropping an index that has to do with the users and the roles. So it's dropping two indexes here and then recreating those indexes here. And in the middle, we've got the code that pertains to our students. The workaround is to comment these out because we are not really interested in the indexes that have to do with users and roles. So I'm going to comment these out. And these happen to be in the up method. And down here, there's a down method. I'm just commenting the code out in the up method. Now, let's rebuild and go back in here and run this command again. This time it seems to work okay. And you can read from this that it successfully created our students table in the database. The next step is to find out that indeed the database has been created. And to even take that one step further I'll create some dummy data to ensure that there is some data in the database. Back in Visual Studio, I'm going to create a class here that I'm going to call dummy data, and it's going to hold some of my student sample data. Now, in this dummy data class, I'm going to paste the code that will generate for me some sample data. I have here a static method named initialize, and it takes a context object. I'm going to resolve this context object. And if you look at the code here, I'm checking whether I have any data in the student's collection. And if there is no data in the student's collection, adding to the student's collection in the database, these students. So I'm adding one student here, that's Bob. The next one is Anne, Sue, Tom, and Joe. And then after I add all these students, 
I save the data in the database. How do I call this initialize method? Let me just copy this. And I'll go to the startup class. And in here, there's the configure method. This one here. So I'm going to go to the configure method. And at the bottom, I'm going to call this dummy data class initialize method. And I will pass it a context object. Now, it's complaining, of course, that I don't have a context object in this method. Through the magic of dependent injection, I can actually inject an application DB context object right into the signature of this method. So I'm going to come in here and select the application DB context object and pass it the context. In here, now my compiler is happy. Now, the next thing I'd like to do is, why not create a regular controller? So I'll come here to controllers, and I'm going to right click and add controller. And the controller I want to use at this stage, the MVC controller with views using entity framework. Let's choose this. Let's select the student model class. And for the database context, we're going to use the application DB context. The name that the controller is going to be given is student controller, and we're fine by that. So let's click on add. I'm being asked to save the solution file, so I'm just going to click on save here. Now I have a controller for students. Let's have a look. It's got all the methods. It's got the index action method. It's got the details action method, create, edit, and of course at the bottom here we'll find a delete. I can have a look at this new controller by running my application. So I'm going to hit Control F5 to run the application and see what it looks like in the browser. So here, in order to see my controllers, I've got to enter students in the URL like this. This will call the students controller. So I'll hit Enter. And here you go. We have the data that we entered. To make this look better, why not add a students button right here so that we can click on it and see our students. So let's go to the views shared folder and open up this layout.cshtml file, which holds the template for the UI in here, I'm going to copy one of these lines, come here, paste it, and for the controller, our controller's name is student, our action method is index, and what we want to appear on the page is student. Let's save and go back here and click on the home page. We have now student. If we click on it, we will see our students. The last thing I want to do is actually create an API for the students. Let's go back into Visual Studio and in order to distinguish the student API controller from the student's controller, I shall create a folder here under controller, which I shall call API. And in here, I will create a web API controller as opposed to the controller 
that I created before, which isn't a Web API controller. So I'm going to go add controller, and this time I'm going to choose this controller, which is the API controller with actions using entity framework. This controller is going to use the same student class. And for the name, I cannot call it students controller because it's going to conflict with the previous controller that I created. We want it to have a different name. So I'm going to stick in here the word API and click on add. Our API controller is now created. Now if we open it and have a look at the code that has been created, you will notice that the route that we need to use is API slash students API. And this produces application JSON. This is the format of data that's returned when this controller is being requested. The default formatter for ASP.NET Web API core is JSON. If we configure the XML formatter, we can essentially also define that here. Now, for this example, I'm not going to do XML, so I'm going to delete this. Let's build and then go to our browser and see if we can get hold of this API controller. So I would type in here API slash students API. Let's hit enter and see what happens. And sure enough, it pulls up my JSON objects that were returned from the API controller. Now, suppose we come here and type in authorize. And this needs to be resolved. What's going to happen here? Well, let me build. and go back and request this page. When I request this page, it is going to ask me to log in using the UI, as you can see here. Now, when you're dealing with APIs, this is not a realistic way of logging into the application because you would want to log in and use token authentication if you want to find out how you can implement token authentication for a web API app using ASP.NET Core, then I invite you to watch my next video. Thank you very much, and I hope to see you at another of my recordings.